Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, we have news on Matt Beatty and Andrew Tolles, plus some talk of about uh, Clayton Kershaw's changeup and a bunch of roster opening day speculation. So let's get Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Dodger fans. This is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. Or even better, go ahead and subscribe in all those places so you never miss a day because you know we're not going to. It's been over three years now and we've still never missed a day. Uh, This is, I guess, our second episode of our fourth year doing Locked On Dodgers. which makes, sounds longer than three years and two days. So uh, that's the way we're going to say it. If this is your first time listening or watching, my name is Jeff Snyder. That is my co-host, Vince Samperio. Uh, Vince and I are both lifelong Dodger fans, just like you are. We've also both, both spent time covering the Dodgers in the press box and the locker room. So we're not quite insiders, which is probably a good thing. But we bring you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. So again, Please subscribe wherever you're watching or listening, uh, especially even if you're not watching on YouTube. We would love a subscription there. And let's go ahead and talk about the Dodgers. Vince, uh, some some news on Monday. We we knew that Matt Beatty was going to be leaving the Dodgers. We didn't know exactly how, but it seemed pretty darn likely that he was no longer going to be in the Dodgers organization. And we kind of speculated last week when the Dodgers DFA'd him that he would end up with a bigger role on a team that wasn't necessarily planning on contending. But instead, it appears that he is going to be basically the same role he's been with the Dodgers on a team that hopes to contend with the Dodgers, and that's the San Diego Padres. Uh, Not exactly what I was expecting. Yeah, definitely not what we were expecting, you know, in division. If it would have been in division, I would have, you know, D-backs, Rockies, just because the nature of what those teams are. Not the Padres, but then when you look at – well, first of all, it's interesting. They have Matt Beatty listed as an outfielder on their website already. Um, Obviously, he can play whatever first and outfield, but they have him listed as an outfielder. But honestly, when you look at the Padres, you're – first of all, you you don't know what they're doing, uh, but they don't really have depth, and they don't really have guys – you know, especially with with Tatis out for a while. They got Cronenworth, Hosmer, Kim, Machado. Then after that, they have some guy named Igai Rosario. And then they just got Luke Voigt, who can be DH first base. Then the outfield, they have Profar, Myers, Grisham, and Matt Beatty now. And that's it. What they do have is four catchers in Alfaro, Camposano, Caratini, and Nola. So I'm not sure if they're going to try to relieve the logjam of catchers. If I know Nola can play first and Caratini can play first, but I don't think they can play anything else. Um, you know, maybe this is a move that's going to allow them to have some flexibility to move somebody else. I'm not sure. I'm sure they still want to get rid of their Cosmer. Um, and if that's the case, then, you know, my baby could fill in there. Him and Voight could kind of switch off at first or DH or whatever the case is. But, yeah, interesting team. But then, you know, when I went to look at them, like, I guess they kind of did need an extra guy off the bench, at least to, that can hit Major League Pitching or that has done it before. Yeah, that catching depth, you mentioned the guys who can play first, but when you have a team that has Eric Cosmer and Matt Beatty and Luke Voigt, being able to play first doesn't actually add you much flex- flexibility. So, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Obviously, the Padres would love to to get rid of Eric Cosmer and, you know, whether rolling out a, a platoon of Voigt and Beatty at first base or uh, I haven't looked at Voigt's splits, actually. I assume the hits lefties better than righties. I don't know that for sure, though. But, uh, yeah, I'm – the, the Padres have shown a willingness in the past, uh, and I mean, even right now, Will Myers is one of their outfielders. The Padres have shown a willingness to play guys who aren't exactly stellar defensively in their outfield. Uh, they've had Matt Kemp. They've had Justin Upton at times. You know, they've had some some bad outfielders. And so uh, Matt Beatty, I think, uh, with, with you know, I, I don't think he's ever going to win a gold glove out there, but I think he could be. Uh, a decent outfielder in, in left field uh, if they need that and playing for space. It, it's a, it's a weird fit, but you know uh, mostly for me, it's like, you know, I, I'm a well wisher of Matt Beatty. I like Matt Beatty. I think he's a good hitter and uh, I would have rather had him 
go somewhere outside the division for my own ability to root for him. And uh, because I do think he's a good hitter and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, because he's likely to be in a similar situation with the, that, that he was with the Dodgers, I assume that his offensive situation will be similar in that, you know, I, I think he's a guy who could really benefit from getting regular plate appearances. And I don't think he's going to get that very much in San Diego any more than he did in LA. And so he probably still won't quite be able to reach his offensive potential. Yeah, it's possible. I think it's, you know, for the Padres, I think it's if Kim can't hit and they need, you know, pro far in the infield, then they only have three outfielders and Matt Beatty's one of those listed. So, you know, maybe he is going to get regular bats. We're not sure, especially with Tatis out early on and them looking for offense. Um, but we'll see. I mean, either way, we wish Matt Beatty the best. We don't wish his new team the best. Um, and I guess, you know, we'll get to see him. I, I, I am happy for like Beatty and his wife because not you know they go from LA to San Diego. That's not a bad that's not a that's not a bad transition. You've done that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not a bad transition at all. So the very least for them, they're gonna be living in a in a nice, beautiful city. Yeah, absolutely. It's a beautiful place, great stadium, all of that. And uh yeah, it's uh you we just have to put a little asterisk next to wishing Matt Beatty the best now. Um one other bit of, of Dodgers news on Monday. I think it came out over the weekend, but it's kind of uh, people have been talking more about it. Uh, before the Dodgers traded Beatty, they had officially renewed his contract, which was just a paperwork, uh, a, a clerical move, because if you don't renew his contract, the alternative is non-tendering him. And then that way they wouldn't have gotten anything for him. As it was, they got a guy named River something. I assume River he has a last Rain? name. River Rain, I think. Uh, that River sounds something. too, too silly. Yeah. Anyway, River something, um, you know, that, that, that guy's going to be an all-star in a few years. We're going to look back and uh, remember the time we couldn't even remember the guy's last name. Um, but uh, the other guy who they renewed uh, at the same time as Beatty was Andrew Tolls. And this one is in a way even more of just a clerical move because Andrew Tolls is not going to play probably ever again for the Dodgers. Um, but it's also a very meaningful clerical move because uh, the Dodgers aren't going to have to pay him. He's on, he's on uh, whatever it, the suspended list, I guess is a uh, restricted list. I think is what it's called. Uh, he doesn't take up a roster spot. It, they don't have to pay him, but by him being renewed and being under contract, uh, he gets his health insurance, which for Andrew tolls right now is the most important thing dealing with the things he's dealing with. I don't know if we've gotten an update anytime recently on his mental health issues. Uh, we'd know at one point a year or so ago, he was homeless, uh, got arrested for vagrancy basically. Uh, and, and the, some of his old teammates reached out to him. The Dodgers reached out to, to work with his family to try to get him into treatment. I don't know how that's going, but I do think it's a classy move by the Dodgers. I, I like to think it's a move that all 30 teams would make in this similar situation to make sure that Andrew Tolls gets to keep his health insurance. And I'm happy about that move. Yeah. One, uh, River Ryan. It's not River Ryan. River Ryan. River Ryan. Supposedly he can play both, or he's played both ways. Uh, there was varying conflicting reports on whether the Dodgers can use him as an infielder or as a pitcher, but I guess we'll find out later. Um, and then, yeah, when it comes to the Dodgers and, and Andrew Tolls, it, it's funny because the story came out last year when they did it the first time. Um, this time it was more of a, you know, just happened to show up in the transactions. I uh, wasn't really – it started getting run on Monday from, like, you know, a bunch of different pages and stuff like that. But, yeah, like you said, it, it's something that probably shouldn't be as heralded as it is. But as we've seen with major league teams and how they treat minor leaguers and how they treat, you know, players sometimes, uh, it's something that is of note and – you know, wherever Andrew Tolls is, hopefully we do a good update soon and it's positive. And, uh, yeah, you know, you know, shout out to the Dodgers for doing it. And, you know, I'm sure other teams have done it in the past, maybe for other players or other situations. But um, this is the one that we have now in front of us, and it's the Dodgers. So good job. Uh, absolutely. So a lot more to talk about. We're going to talk more about Kershaw's changeup and a lot of roster speculation. So thank you for making Locked on Dodgers your first listen every day. And please keep it Locked on Dodgers. Hey, our partner today is a product I recently started using every day again. 
almost a decade ago, I lost over 100 pounds and I was in literally the best shape of my life. Part of my regimen then was Athletic Greens. It was a vital and super helpful part of my healthy lifestyle. As you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, I've let myself go since then, but I'm working on trying to get healthy again. And once again, Athletic Greens is a very important element of that. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. All the things. One thing I've learned is that when you're really focusing on your health, it can get expensive to buy all the supplements and vitamins that your body needs. Athletic Greens costs you less than $3 a day, and it's full of high-quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. It's a ton cheaper than buying all the supplements separ separately. And to top it off, for every purchase, Athletic Greens donates to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry here in the U.S. They donated over 1.2 million meals last year. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash MLB network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, we are back here on Locked on Dodgers. We want to thank you again for making Locked on Dodgers your first listen every day. We also want to tell you about Locked on MLB prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia. He's going deep on the MLB star stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Uh, talking about the Dodgers some more, Clayton Kershaw pitched on Monday and uh, used his changeup. I think he only threw maybe five or six changeups in, in his four innings. He had a, a great four innings. He gave up a hit to the first batter he faced, uh, ended up erasing him with a double play and didn't allow another base runner in his four innings of work. He looked really good. His stuff wasn't lights out. His fastball sat 90-91 for the most part um, and, and more 90s than 91s. Uh, but his slider was working. His, his curveball, he threw it a little more than he has in his previous starts this spring, and he did throw that changeup, including getting a couple swings and misses and I think a, a strikeout looking on, on the changeup uh, after the game or after his – during the game, after he was done pitching, Kirsten Watson talked to him, and she asked him specifically about the changeup, and he kind of laughed. He said, you know, I say I'm going to use it every year, and I haven't yet, but, uh, you know, he he said he was, he was enjoying – he liked the way it felt today, but then the last pitch he threw in the game – uh, was a changeup to Christian Walker. And uh, those of us with long memories know that Christian Walker against Clayton Kershaw does not always have a history of ending well for the Dodgers. And this one could have been bad. He Walker hit the ball 105 miles an hour, but uh, it was caught and for the last out of Kershaw's day. And Kershaw mentioned that at bat, and he, he said that was kind of an eye-opener to him to realize that he can't just throw the changeup whenever he wants and he needs to make sure to locate it. But uh Kershaw was happy with his fastball command was the first thing he mentioned. And uh, overall, a good tune-up. Do uh, you have any thoughts on Kershaw's outing, Vince? Yeah, I mean, he looked good. Um, he was able to get some more swings and misses, like you mentioned. Some of them because of changeup. It, from what I've seen so far, his changeup's interesting because there's not too much movement. It's more of a you know change of pace rather more than anything. It does seem like he, he's just throwing a fastball, but it is coming out significantly slower. Uh, which is, you know, still can still work. But like you said, you can't just throw whenever, especially if it doesn't have the movement that, you know, some other people's changeups have, uh, because if you, they do time it or they do realize what it is, you know, it's very easy to square up. So, uh, but yeah, Kershaw has been looking good so far. He mentioned that, you know, he feels good that he's, you know, he's been through a few times already uh, on the mound and the health wise, he's feeling good. So that's a good sign for the Dodgers. That's a good sign for Kershaw. And just, you know, exciting to see what he can do this year, especially if he can integrate that changeup. I'm sure he's going to toy with the grip a little bit, you know, maybe try to get a little bit more movement on it. Um, but the way it sits, it's just like we mentioned before, just one thing that changes enough or has enough of a change that can throw hitters off and give them one more thing to worry about. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned the the lateral movement on Kershaw's changeup, and I'm looking at the StatCast data from today. I think it was our first game of the spring that we actually have StatCast data. Um, 
And and this is showing only four changeups from Kershaw. Uh, but the one that that Walker hit pretty hard had by far the the least vertical or, or horizontal run, and it had less vertical movement. Uh, the the three good ones, two swinging strikes and and a ball, all had 26 inches of drop and 10 or 11 inches of uh, lateral movement, basically opposite direction, or arm side run, basically opposite direction of his slider. Uh, the one that Walker hit only had 23 inches of drop, so three inches less, and then only seven inches of lateral movement. So three inches less of drop and four inches less of lateral movement. And uh, that little bit of difference, it can make the difference between hitting the ball off the end of the bat or not hitting it all versus hitting it with the barrel. And uh, so probably a good learning experience for Kershaw and it's fun to to finally have that data. And, and if you look at it, it definitely compared to, uh, you know, it, it's the, the changeup sits 82 to 84 miles an hour. So it's kind of between his curveball and his slider on velocity. He will occasionally his slow, slow his slider down to somewhere close to that, but, but it's got opposite movement. And so it's basically, even if the, the velocity is similar to the slider, it's about 16 or 17 inches different of movement because uh, uh, six inches this way instead of 11 inches that way. Uh, so it definitely, you know, when we talked about it last week, it, we mentioned it doesn't even have to be a great slider or a great changeup to be effective. It's just having that fourth pitch and having another thing that, that hitters need to worry about. Uh, it's, you know, for me, it seems like a promising sign that he was able to throw it effectively on Monday. And uh, even if they weren't all perfect, it, it's uh probably the best we've seen him throw a change up in his life. Yeah. And especially into his third start of the spring, usually we, in the past, we've seen it in the spring early on. And then he kind of just says, eh, whatever, and kind of gets over it. Uh, the fact that he's sticking with it, you know, makes it seem that he is going to be using it. And like I said, the, just the one differentiator adding, you know, Kershaw hasn't had a, a bad season yet since he's, you know, dropped in velocity, but he, ha you know, his ERA has steadily gone up over here and there, but he can get back to, you know, a top pitcher in the, in the, in the league for sure. Maybe all-star status, if he can develop that change up and use it as we've seen so far and continue to use it because the other part too is like, you know, these guys, a lot of the Diamondbacks guys have seen Kershaw for a while. So, you know, just adding that change up, if he doesn't throw it too much, you know, it doesn't make too much of a difference. But for people that have seen Kershaw only a few times and and for guys that use video so much these days, they're not going to have too much video of it to go at least the first time around. And, you know, other than the guy, other than the teams in the division that we're seeing more than a handful of times, you're going to get a team that might only see him one time and, you know, he'll be able to use it a little bit more effectively in, the, in those instances. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's good stuff. One other bit of Kershaw, not quite news, but uh, I saw some of his comments on Walker Bueller being named the opening day starter. And Kershaw basically said exactly what you'd expect him to say, but you could tell that he he means it. He's excited for, for Bueller and uh, basically had nothing but good to say about Walker Bueller. And, you know, it seemed like a very real passing of the torch kind of moment. Yeah. And, and you know, the time has come and, you know, Kershaw – not that I think he would have made a big deal regardless if he thought he still deserved it, but you know the fact of the matter is he's seen what Bueller's done. He he, he acknowledges what Bueller's done, and I think they're good enough friends now to where you know it's not so much a, a competition as more of a hey, you know what, let's go out and both get it. Yep, and maybe it gives Kershaw motivation to to be the uh, 2023 Dodgers opening day starter and, and go out there and you know as a crafty lefty with a changeup instead. Yeah. Okay. One other bit of starting pitching news, uh, David Price, uh, Dave Roberts talked about David Price, I think, before the game today, uh, and he mentioned that uh, David Price, basically the reason that we haven't seen him yet in spring training is because with the uncertainty during the lockout of when spring training was going to start, the approach that Price chose to take to getting ready for the season was to be more conservative. And makes sense with, you know, the, all the mileage on David Price's arm and, and all of that, uh, he can't really afford to just be in a constant state of readiness. And so one of the, uh, the, the bits of collateral damage of that, I guess you could call it, is that David Price basically isn't just, he just isn't built up right now. And it's, it's kind of an open question that we're actually going to talk more about in the next segment 
does that mean that David Price isn't going to be ready to start on the opening day roster? We know he's not going to be in the starting rotation. Will he be on the roster or will he start on the injured list? But, uh, you know, it, it was good to get some clarity on why we haven't seen Price. And it's not an actual injury. It's just he's just not at that point in spring training yet. Yeah, and, you know, obviously with Price, we weren't sure. You know, we're still not sure exactly what the plan is for him. And the way the other guys have been throwing this spring, you know, I don't really see him having too much of a fit, uh, especially once they cut down the roster after the first month. Like, if he's not ready to go in the next two weeks or so, uh, you know, I don't know if he survives after that. They cut drops back down to 26 men. And um, for what it is, you know, he he's – been willing to do whatever it takes, if, whether it's bullpen, whether it's, you know, relief, whether it's long relief, whether it's out of the bullpen, whether it's starting, he's done it all. But, you know, I think I don't, I don't know what the plan is. And we talked about this a few weeks ago or a couple weeks ago where maybe it's a matter of they try to get him out there and, and hope that he can get through a couple of times looking decent enough and, you know, maybe try to trade down, eat some of the contract, trade them and, and clear that roster spot. But it's just very interesting it's going to be very interesting to see without injuries, what happens to David price and how he finds his way into the Dodgers roster. If he can. Yeah, absolutely. And we are going to, in just a minute, we're going to talk more about the the opening day roster and what that means for guys like David price, what it means for another guy like Phil Bickford, who we also haven't seen yet in the spring, what, you know, what that might mean. So a lot more to talk about, about the, the opening day roster, uh, including Jake lamb and, and a couple other guys. So, uh, thank you again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. And again, please keep it Locked On Dodgers. Thanks again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. We also want to uh, tell you for your second listen, you should check out Locked On MLB, where Paul Francis Sullivan, please call him Sully, brings you his unique perspective on the major leagues past and present. It's free and available wherever you get wherever you get podcasts. And now uh, let's talk about the opening day roster. Um there's, you know, there's a few guys, basically there's three non-roster invitees right now who are battling for, for jobs. You've got Jake Lamb, you got Kevin Pillar, and you got Shane Green. Um, I'm not going to lie, Vince. I had forgotten, I, I wouldn't say I'd forgotten that Shane Green existed. I had forgotten that Shane Green was back with the Dodgers until I saw him pitching a couple days ago this weekend. Um, and, but, you know, we, we, you and I were talking before we started recording uh, Eric Steven over at True Blue LA put out his opening day roster predictions, and he has Shane Green on on the opening day roster, which would require a forty man roster move because he is a non roster guy. Um, but uh, I, I think you know we can just have a conversation about overall opening day roster thoughts. But one uh, one interesting note, you know, that we do know for sure now, it's official that the opening day roster will be twenty eight guys instead of twenty six for the first basically three weeks of the season, they can have 28 players on the roster. And one interesting little caveat loophole there is uh, starting in April or starting in May, when the rosters go back to 26 at that point, the roster limit on the number of pitchers will kick in and they, no team can have more than 13 pitchers on the roster at any time, but that limit does not apply. uh, You know, by saying you can have 28 players on the roster, that doesn't mean 14 pitchers and 14 position players. There is no limit on the number of pitchers. And Dave Roberts said last week that the Dodgers are likely to use those two extra spots and maybe more for pitchers. And so I don't think it's even a guarantee that we'll get even 13 position players on the opening day roster. Uh, the Dodgers might even go with 16 pitchers and, and 12 position players to start the season. Uh, doesn't, seem probably likely, but it's a possibility. Uh, but, you know, because they're going to have at least 15 pitchers on the roster. I think it's ba- virtually guaranteed they'll have at least 15 pitchers on the roster. That does mean maybe a guy like Shane Green has a possibility of making the team. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I I haven't been impressed with Shane Green. I'd still be more inclined to go with Mitch White over, over Shane Green. Uh, but, you know, it, it wouldn't shock me, I guess. Yeah, uh, Shane Green, we think he's only thrown, unless he threw in today's game, which I didn't catch after Kershaw left, he's only thrown a third of an inning, I believe, in Cactus League. So if if he were to make the opening day roster, it's going to be 
because of work he's doing in the backfields and in sim games or B games, it's not going to be for what he's done so far. I mean, we're like we're ten days, we're like ten days away from opening day. So, um, one guy that you know has looked decent again in short, short supply, but that could be that guy is Carson Fulmer. You know, he's thrown three innings this spring, has three strikeouts, has that changeup that's looked pretty good. You know, he's a guy that I'm sure the Dodgers don't have, don't feel a need to rush to get him on the opening day roster. Where a guy, you know, he's a guy that they are more likely to develop and continue to develop. Whereas a guy like Shane Green, he basically becomes our 40th man on the 40 man roster. If he did make it where, you know, if they need somebody, then he's the first guy to go. Um, you know, he has, has not really re- recovered and, and, or not recovered, but he hasn't really been able to get back to where he was before when he was doing really, really well uh, as a reliever in the major league. So, yeah, I, I I don't see it, but I guess it's possible. I mean, there's even guys like John Duplantier. He's had a few innings, hasn't given up any runs. Uh, there's been, you know, I think Bo Burrows has done decent enough. Uh, I think he just went that one game, though. So there's a bunch of guys that I haven't done too much this spring that could find their way on the opening day roster. But, yeah, like you said, I think a guy like Mitch White, who you know, has had – hasn't had the greatest spring and and I know he pitched on the backfields I think uh earlier on Monday and struggled a little bit as well but we've seen him he's a guy that we saw get gouts and was able to to help out last year when they needed him so it's for all the in, or the lack of intrigue there is for like the position players like starting wise and the rotation starting wise uh there is some intrigue into how they get this 28 man roster formed yeah, for sure. Carson Fulmer, they did uh, just in the last day or two assign him to minor league camp. And so that basically closes the door on him being on the opening day, opening day roster. But I agree with you that he has been uh, leaps and bounds more impressive than Shane Green. You mentioned Green has thrown a third of an inning. In that one third of an inning, he allowed two hits and had two walks. Uh, luckily, only one run scored. Uh, but a 27 ERA and a 12 whip both uh, are, are a little bit higher than what you're looking for in a relief pitcher. Um, w- one interesting one is Phil Bickford. Phil Bickford has not yet pitched in the spring and we don't really know why, you know, we haven't got, we got the, we got the clarity on David Price. We haven't gotten that clarity on Phil Bickford. So we don't really have much of an idea what's up with Bickford. We have to assume that there's some sort of physical ailment, whether it's an injury or just, you know, something. And it, with opening day being, you know, March 29th now, and that means what well, opening day is 10 days from now. Hard to see Bickford being ready to uh, to be on the opening day roster, which puts the Dodgers in a little bit of a, you know, a lacking of right-handed relief pitching, which, you know, overall, it, it's a weird situation to be in. We've talked about the left-handed heaviness of the Dodgers in the past, but uh, with, with Bickford being questionable, the only for sure right-handed uh, pitchers on the opening day roster are Trine and Hudson and Gratterall and probably Evan Phillips. And then, you know, uh, and then they only have Bueller and Gonsolin in the starting rotation. And so they're left-handed heavy in the, in the rotation too. Uh, and, you know, in the, in the bullpen, you've got a lot of guys. It looks like Caleb Ferguson, even though we had heard that he was probably not going to be ready for opening day, looks like he probably will be. He's thrown several times and, and the stuff looks pretty much ready uh, Tommy Canley probably won't be, uh, but yeah, there's uh, so many question marks about this bullpen. Yeah, and what we, th- I mean, it's still going to be a strength overall, but you know what we thought was a for sure, like you know we we had already penned in Bigford for like the sixth inning as early as the sixth fifth inning whenever they needed him. Uh, he's a guy that came in and kind of was the second fireman to the Blake Trinan where. If it was earlier in the game, they needed a guy. They needed outs in a big spot. He'd be the guy that came in. Um, so that role and, like I said, the right-handedness is something that they need from him. We haven't heard. You know, Mookie Betts didn't get into games until over the weekend. Um, there's been guys that Roberts. You know, he's used wording like guys ramped up differently and things like that. We just haven't heard necessarily about Bigford specifically, but. You know, it's another thing, too, where if he's doing work on the back end and he's, you know, done the what what they usually want is up a couple up and downs, maybe for a reliever, some back to back days throwing stuff like that. If he's doing on the back end and maybe working on some stuff, 
it's possible we still see him. But yeah, like I said, with, with us 10 days out now, it's it doesn't seem too likely. And the other part is is we don't, you know, with with what we know so far and the bunch of lefties that they do have, that it's gonna be, you know, a little bit different look in the bullpen. The one good thing is that we've seen guys that really step up. Victor Gonzalez looks good so far in his in his two or three out, I think three outings after uh he pitched on on Monday. Um, we've seen Gratterall do well. Gratterall, who now has the cutter grip uh, that he learned from Kenley Jansen. I don't think we've necessarily seen any Kenley Jansen like cutters, but for him to add something else to, to his repertoire is always going to be good. And, you know, it's a matter of the back end of the bullpen is still strong. It's just a matter of cleaning up the middle right now. And, you know, Phil Bickford goes a long way in fixing that. If we, he's not there, the Dodgers will be fine. But like I said, they do get a little bit left-handed heavy. And if they face teams, a lot of right-handers, it doesn't necessarily match up too well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, uh, you know, th- then you have the the position player question. And the fact is, you know, when, when you look at a guy like Jake Lamb, who is hit- hitting the ball really well in spring training, and, you know, he, even when he was an all-star, he couldn't hit lefties. He's always been a righty masher uh, or a nobody masher. And if he's back to being a righty masher, that's a position that, you know, you would think would have value. But then you look at with this short bench, if the Dodgers are only going to have four position players on the bench, one of them is Austin Barnes. And then you've got uh, Hans Alberto, who seems like a lock. You've got Gavin Lux, who's a lock. And you've got Edwin Rios, who definitely hasn't done any of this anything this spring to suggest that he doesn't deserve to be on the roster. And so there's just not going to be room for a guy like Jake Lamb. And, you know, the – the good news is hopefully he can go down to triple a, get regular at bats and uh, you know, really continue to uh, to mash righties and hopefully continue to develop because somebody's going to get hurt at some point. And uh, if that's an infielder, Jake Lamb is a guy who can fill in and, and bump guys around, you know, or whatever. Uh, even if it's just filling in on the bench because Edwin Rios has to play third base for a while or whatever. Uh, you know, there, there's going to be an opportunity for Jake Lamb. I'm a lot more, it, you and I, we talked last week, and we both said we're going to have to see more from Jake Lamb, Lamb to really believe it. I haven't seen a ton more from him, but I have seen some more, and it seems like, you know, I, I was watching some video of him even when he was at his peak in 2017. He looks like a, a better hitter right now than he was then, uh, and you know, it is spring training, but I, I'm more optimistic there. I still uh, don't don't have much optimism about Kevin Pillar doing much to contribute, but. Uh, but Jake Lamb, I could see it. Yeah, and, you know, he would fit the mold of, uh, I guess not fit the mold so much as like the Muncie and Taylors of, of the team in the past because he was a former All-Star. He did have a couple big years before, but, you know, a guy that's kind of how to recreate himself. There was an article, I think Plunkett uh, from the OG Shure, just I haven't read it yet, but there's an article about him, how he you know, was, was going through things that, that players go through when they struggle that hard and, you know, go from being an all-star player to a guy that is fighting for a bench spot. And, and there's a lot to go through it. And, you know, for somebody, you know, he's going to be putting in the work. And like I said, as long as the Dodgers can keep them in the organization and from what we've seen in the past, they've been able to sell certain guys on staying in the organization and, you know, kind of realizing that, Hey, you're, you're probably going to make, you know, Steven Souza, maybe we probably would have got picked up or, or, or he cleared waivers, I think last year at one point, but, you know, he ended up coming back to the Dodgers, ended up, you know, unfortunately for us and the Dodgers getting some big at bats late in the year, but, you know, they've, they've done a good job. And then Pilar came here. He said he had other major league deals in hand came here in order to whatever, you know, hope that the Dodgers have the, the magic trick for him as well. So the good thing compared to last year is that, you know, if guys get hurt, Jake Lamb and Kevin Pilar, you could do a lot worse than, uh, it's a lot different than, you know, Steven Souza and, and Billy McKinney and Luke Rayleigh and Zach Rex and all those other guys from last year. Yep. And uh, I guess last thing, just a brief mention, speaking of guys who batted against Tyler Matzik in the NLCS last year, Albert Pujols has gone back to St. Louis to finish his career. He said he's going to play his final season with the Cardinals. Uh, you know, I'm happy for him. Uh, not sad to see him not back with the Dodgers. Uh, you know, it was fun to have him in Dodger blue for, for most of one season. I, I wish him the best. I'm not optimistic about him having a great season. I wouldn't be shocked if he uh, is playing his last half a season and not his ha- last full season, but uh, you know, good for him going back to St. Louis and retiring as a Cardinal whenever that time comes. Yeah. I think, I think him announcing the final season is his way of trying to tell the Cardinals, I need to be around the whole season. 
uh, you know, whether that's something that they like or not. I mean, realistically, that division is, you know, the Brewers are good, but everyone else is not good in that division. So realistically, they could be fighting for a playoff spot just for the simple fact of everyone else around them is bad and they play them so many times. So it will be interesting to see if he does struggle, you know, what kind of leash they have with him because, you know, the fans are already super happy that he's back. Him and Yachty and Wainwright going for the, you know, the last ride or the last dance, whatever it is. Uh, but realistically, those guys could all struggle, and then it's going to be not the last dance, but uh, or I guess it would be the last dance, but not a happy one. It'll be ending in early October instead of late October. Yeah. Uh, that'll do it for today, I think. you have anything else, Vince? No, we long one today, but, you know, there's a lot to talk about, and I'm not going to take that for granted ever again. Yep, absolutely. It's it's nice to have things to talk about. We hope you guys are willing to tolerate an occasional 36-minute episode from us. We try to keep it under 30. Uh, we really do appreciate all of you listening and watching every day. It means the world to us. Please continue to do that. Uh, if you have friends or family who love the Dodgers as much as you do, please tell them about the show. Maybe they'll like it. Uh, if you are not listening every day, we'd love if you add one or two days a month to your rotation. Uh, that would be great. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Locked On Dodgers. You can call a Vint, follow Vince at Vince Semperio. You can follow me at Snydog, and the DMs are open in all of those places. Our email address is lockedondodgers at gmail.com. And our phone number for voicemails or text messages is 323-863-LOCK-5625. We are here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one.